Hi, so I'm Lorene Wells, and I am giving the September CGDC virtual talk. The title of this talk was originally Why the World Needs a Christian MMO, but I have expanded it to include all Christian games, uh, especially for this talk. So before I get going, though, let's all get on the same page with vocabulary. Some people in the Christian community although maybe not this audience, um, but just in case there's somebody who's unfamiliar with gamer jargon, let me clarify that right from the start so you aren't sitting here through the whole speech trying to figure out what kind of multicultural mission opportunity I'm talking about. That is not what MMO means. In the gamer world, MMO stands for Massively Multiplayer Online, which is actually short for MMOG, which is Massively Multiplayer Online Game, which are the largest, most expensive, and most difficult kinds of games being made currently in the game industry. MOGs include a subclass called MMORPG, or MORPEG, which stands for Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Game. That's a mouthful to say every time you tell someone what kind of game you like to play, so it's easier just to say MORPEG or MMO. Now you know why we shorten it. There are also MMO FPSGs, MMO SIMs, MMO RTSGs, which stand respectively for Massively Multiplayer Online First Person Shooter Games, Massively Multiplayer Online Simulations, and Massively Multiplayer Online Real Time Strategy Games, the latter of which are far less common. More pegs are by far the most common form of MUG because they lend themselves to technology most effectively. More pegs are pretty much the only kind of computer game I like to play. I've played a lot of computer games. I've given just about every genre at least a 15 minute try, usually a few hours before I decide if I like it or not. The thing about more pegs though, is that there are other people in the game world creating an entire social environment of like-minded people who are all interested in playing the same game at the same time and working to achieve the same or at least similar goals within the game. They are frequently more cooperative than other types of games, meaning that players help each other more than fighting against each other, and work together to achieve challenging goals that cannot be accomplished alone. They're exciting, dangerous, challenging, and always waiting with a new adventure to discover. And for a young mother who was five months pregnant at the time with insomnia at three o'clock in the morning, that was a lifesaver for me. It provided sufficient distraction so I didn't worry myself sick in the middle of the night about all the possible things that could go wrong during pregnancy. And I was able to escape de-stress and eventually relax enough that I could go back to sleep. But I'm getting ahead of myself now. Hopefully everyone is clear now on what the definition of an MMO and more peg is, and I can give you a little background on my experience with games and what led me into game development. I've been married to my wonderful husband, Ron, since 1991. He puts up with all my crazy ideas. We met in college in Moscow, Idaho. Living in Wa Then we lived in Washington State for a while and then lived in Oregon for 21 years. After both our fathers died in 2014, we moved to Idaho in 2016 to be closer to our remaining family. We have four children, three sons and a daughter, and we homeschooled their whole lives. Games have always been an integral part of our family. My paternal grandmother taught me how to play blackjack, two versions of solitaire, and three versions of poker, as well as a couple different ways to play dominoes and Yahtzee. When I was a junior in junior high, my family hosted a church game night where we had board games set up on several different tables, and at intervals, everyone would get up and move to the next table and pick up the board game in whatever form it was and continue playing it. I still remember that night as a highlight of my childhood. My dad was the first person to introduce me to video games. Our first game system was the original Atari with Space Invaders and Pong. Soon after this, we got an Intellivision with bowling and baseball. We had many fun family nights playing video games. It was the only time I actually enjoyed playing sports. By today's standards, the graphics were horrible, but we thought they were awesome at the time. It was amazing to us to be able to interact with the images on the television screen instead of just staring at it from the couch. 
Another time, when I was in high school, a friend had come over after school to share dinner with us, and after dinner, we played a card game called Pit. It's a game based on the stock market, where each player tries to corner the market by collecting shares of a certain commodity. And wheat is the most valuable one. My friend had been losing the rounds quite frequently, but she was having a lot of fun. And suddenly, she leaped out of her chair, slammed her hands on the table, and shouted, Corner on wheat! And at that moment, the table cracked in half and collapsed. All the cards fell on the floor. Even though the table was broken, we all had so much fun. It was a very memorable night. Games create powerful memories. By the time I got to college, personal computers were starting to become more common among the general population, no longer limited only to businesses that had enough money and space to store a crane. When I met my husband in college, he was one of the lucky ones to own his own personal computer. He had a Tandy X86. Some of you may even remember those. This was before the days of the internet. There was no Google, no Yahoo, not even CompuServe or AOL had been born yet, though they would launch before our college days ended. Ron would play games like Hack and NetHack and connected to other computers over the phone line using a modem through a bulletin board system called War World War IV or with BBS. We called it BBS for short. I think our modem was about 1,200 baud but we knew someone who had a super fast 2400 baud modem. Those were the days. After we got married, I discovered that there were discussion groups on these BBSs called subs. So I started my own BBS called the Tiny Zoo. And as the sysop, I was the zookeeper. Two of my lifelong friends came out of that experience as a BBS sysop. And of course, the name of my company has its origins there as well. There was also a game on the WIV network called Trade Wars that I hosted on my BBS. I never really got into it, but a lot of my users enjoyed it, and I gained some early exposure at hosting online games for my players through that experience. We continued to play board games, card games, and role-playing games with local friends as well. Three couples that were friends from the college I stayed in, the, in the same area for the time, and we became lifelong friends. We made friends with another couple right at the end of our college careers, and that couple became the godparents of our children. Games of some sort were nearly always involved in some way when we gathered together. We created many happy memories around the game table. In late college, when I was, it was late college when I designed my first game. I had forgotten about it until we were packing boxes into storage in 2015 to prepare for selling our house and came across the old deck of handmade cards. Finding that old deck sort of validated for me, I really am a game developer at heart. It's more than just temporary educational games I created with my children to help them learn difficult concepts, which I did create a lot of games for my children. And it's more than just games we played with friends that have driven me to become a professional game developer. It's part of me. It's who I am. I didn't know it yet, though, when I was in college or even in early my marriage. The first few years of our marriage, my husband and I would have arguments because we, I would get jealous of him sitting in front of his computer, staring at an inanimate box with illuminated pixels instead of spending time with me. I didn't understand his attraction to computer games. I wanted us to live happily ever after, but this did not look like the life together I had imagined. I grew to hate computer games. I did not understand them. I was jealous of them taking my husband away from me. Little did I know that everything was about to change forever. Running my own BBS had helped me understand a little bit better about his affection for the computer, and him buying me my own computer went a long way towards solving many of our disputes over whose turn it was to use a computer or how the desktop icons should be arranged. But unbeknownst to me at the time, it would be a computer game that really brought us together. 
A computer game would change my life, strengthen my marriage, and turn me into the game developer that I am today. I still had a few more experiences to endure before I got to that point, though. As my children grew older, computers became more advanced, card games became massive collector sets, and everything got more complicated. The introduction of improved computer graphics, no more ASCII characters blipping across the screen, brought computer games to a whole new level. Suddenly, blood and graphic violence became an issue we had to worry about as parents. And we did notice a definite increase in aggressive behavior when our sons would play violent games too much, so we had to limit their exposure to them. This sent us on a search for kid-friendly games. Most of them were educational in nature, and most of the educational games were more like exams with pretty graphics than fun games to play. We spent far more money than we could legitimately afford buying games that no one wanted to play, in our search for fun games for our kids. We also noticed that our kids memorized game content far faster and far easier than they memorized any of their schoolwork. Our oldest son memorized the entire progression tree for the game Civilization just so he wouldn't have to keep looking it up on the chart. Our youngest son memorized all the Pokemon creatures, all their attacks, and which creature was needed to beat which one for opponents. Very clearly, games were a driving force for our children and our family, so we searched desperately for games that were meaningful and useful, and not just time sinks that waste our lives. We had the technology, but no meaningful games were to be found. I had begun to believe that I simply did not like computer games. None of them held my interest longer than a month, and most could not hold my interest for longer than an hour. Most, many of them felt like a complete waste of time. Then one of my husband's old high school friends encouraged us to play a new role-playing game with him called EverQuest that we could play online. Because of my disdain for computer games and the conflict they caused in our marriage and our home, we didn't play right away. EverQuest was launched in 1999, but we didn't start playing until 2001 when the Velius expansion was released. It was this game, EverQuest, more than any other game that changed my life. Playing with real people online and in a persistent immersive world was unlike anything or any experience I have ever had. And my husband and I played the game together. We played it with each other, not against each other. And that had a tremendous impact on me. It really is true that the family that plays together stays together. EverQuest had enough social and exploration content to satisfy my craving for human interaction and discovery, and it had enough quests and achievement content to keep my husband challenged. We both became addicted to the game and really enjoyed playing it together. And I finally understood intimately well why my husband enjoyed spending time on his computer. Now we both wanted to play. Brad McQuaid and the team at Verant created a game unlike any other before or since. EverQuest had just the right balance of challenge and fun, victory and defeat, tedium and triumph that no other game has matched, though many have tried. We found out soon after creating our accounts that we had friends playing on Terra Mar servers, so we restarted our characters over there and played on that server. I was pregnant with our daughter when we started playing, and we made friends with the guild leaders of the guild we were playing with at the time, so well that my husband wanted to name our daughter after one of them, who had named his character after one of the characters in the movie Willow. Her name is Kaya. This is how deeply games have impacted our lives. EverQuest and the players in it influenced the name we chose for our child. Like our children, the games that they played, we too found ourselves memorizing tremendous volumes of information in order to succeed in the game. I was memorizing trade skill recipes that are only relevant in the game context. Things like a rat ear and a clump of dough makes a rat ear pie or a bat wing and fresh fish make fish rolls. Again, 
I felt the longing for more meaningful gameplay. The culmination of these events and the multitude of game ideas growing in my head for new games that I've never seen in stores but wanted to play brought me to a point where I decided to make my own game. After a year of failed attempts trying to find a company who would either buy my game idea or hire me to create the game under their brand, I established my own company in August of 2003. I wanted my company to honor God, but I also wanted to honor the business name we had been using since 1990. Thus the name Heaven's Blessings Tiny Zoo. Later, we converted the company structure from sole proprietor to an LLC for legal purposes, but kept the name. I made friends with an out-of-work programmer while playing in the beta of World of Warcraft, and he joined the team as my first volunteer on the Bible game that would later become titled Visions, our flagship project. Visions is the world's first Christian Morpeg. There was one other Christian Morpeg being developed by an indie team designed and led by Lethal Grody called Foundations of Hope Online. It was a fantasy game based on a book series he had written, but he canceled that project. A few other Christian game developers have created online games, but they are not massively multiplier persistent worlds. There are some Christian Facebook games, some Christian games for phones, and Christian games for consoles, but there are no other Christian Morpegs. Visions really is the only game of its kind that has ever been attempted. It is an historical Morpeg set in the ancient Roman Empire with a quest and skill-based gameplay. Player characters start out as a slave recently arrived by ship on the island of Cyprus to reside at the master's farm, where they can learn skills to obtain their freedom. The characters will learn basic skills like cooking, fishing, swimming, and climbing, and they will also have the opportunity to learn professions like blacksmithing, pottery, farming, hunting, to be a disciple, an athlete, or physician, among others. There's an overarching scripture quest where they collect all the fragments of the Holy Scriptures to form a complete Bible. And there are history quests to learn about the historical events of the local area from the time period. The plan is to implement player-created quests as well, so players can actually create their own content in the game. We continue working on Visions after all these years because we believe the world needs this game. We have put thousands of hours of research into Visions because we want to create a game that will enrich people's lives when they play it. We want to make a game that when they step away from the keyboard, they can take something with them that will make their life better in the real world. When people do trade skills and visions, they will learn actual recipes, many of which they can recreate in their own homes. Some people never learn to cook when they're growing up because school and life take up all their time. Visions will potentially teach people how to cook a variety of foods using ancient recipes and ingredients. When they mix pigments for a pottery glaze, they will use actual ingredients that could theoretically be used to make a pottery glaze of the desired color. When they complete scripture quests, they will be able to actually read Bible verses in the game. When they encounter ancient texts in the game world, our intent is that they will be able to actually read those ancient works of literature. When they visit a city in the game world, they will encounter artist renditions of historical landmarks based on floor plans of buildings found in ancient ruins. When they travel across the land, they will experience geographically relevant terrain, city names, and locations. When they travel between continents in the game, they will be able to experience the Holy Land in a way that has never been experienced before. They will be able to experience history. A modified and optimized for gameplay version of history, yes, but still more meaningful than any other game that has been made. By contrast, the games currently available on store shelves are endless remakes of previous games that have at one time proven financially successful. The AAA companies are no longer willing to take a risk on something new and different. They just want to make more and more of the same thing. Just more renditions of sports games, shooters with an ever-increasing gore, and an ever-increasing flood of zombie games, which are a subset of the shooter game. And the fa- there are fantasy games, which I do like, 
but they are kind of all look the same after a while. Korean developers have introduced their Asian flavor of games to the market, which generally have a much stronger spiritual content than American-made games, but that spiritual content is not Christian. All the current Morpegs are sat saturated with demons, imps, dark spirits, and beings of darkness. Generally, these e evil creatures are in fact viewed as evil in the game story, and the players are usually recruited to find the source of their arrival and exterminate the evil from the land. Hurrah! A noble cause for certain. But evil is not always viewed as evil, especially in the newer games. In one more peg that our family played for a short time, Black Desert Online, there is a dark spirit that serves an advisor to the play character, and it is impossible to advance through the game without completing the quest that the black spirit requires. More and more games incorporating demonic spirituality into the core of the gameplay, and people accept it without question. People are that hungry for new and meaningful games. We also see games like Grand Theft Auto, which most people know about, most commonly referred to as GTA, which has several remakes available now, where players are encouraged to murder priests, to pick up prostitutes, and of course, to steal cars and crash them. The developers of GTA never intended it to be for children. It is clearly labeled as having mature content for adults only. But I know families whose kids have played it, some of you probably know a few too. The kids don't think there's anything wrong with a game that teaches them to steal, kill, and destroy and commit adultery. It's just a game, they say. And many of the movies that are coming out certainly aren't much better. Perhaps at breakneck speed, which our society is falling into depravity, is unavoidable. Perhaps the decline of morality was meant to happen, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. But that doesn't mean we have to participate in it. We want to create something better, something wholesome, something meaningful, something that changes people for the better after having experienced our game. We want to make a game that is fun, yes, but also goes deeper than that. Something that touches their soul with an ember of light that can grow and illuminate their daily lives. This is the kind of game we want visions to be. This is the kind of game we think most Christian game developers want to make. This is the kind of game we are trying to make. We think the world needs a Christian Morpeg like Visions because a game like this can make the whole world a better place. We need people to come alongside us and help us bring this dream to reality. We have the skilled developers who are willing and able to work, but the problem is that they have to spend their days working full-time jobs for other companies to pay the bills and only have a few hours a week to work on Visions. We would like to get enough money coming in from supporters to be able to pay our, de our developers to work on Visions full-time. We've been getting about $20 a month, give or take, in sales from players who want to experience Visions, but that is not even enough to pay the internet bill, much less to feed our developers. We need people who share our dream to make the world a better place through Christian games and support our efforts to finish Visions in a timely manner. We have proven that we can complete a game. We have completed several games of different types already. We have produced a small scale racing game for up to 14 players called Chariots. We produced an Elvish language application called Padik Adelen. We released a card game called Messiah, a board game called Treasures in Heaven, and another board game my son designed called Silverguard Chronicles. And we've proven that we do not give up easy. We've been working on Vision since 2003 with a volunteer team. We've put our money where our mouth is, paying for bandwidth, software licenses, computer and server hardware out of our own pockets. Our developers are dedicated and devoted to this cause. And since we switched to using the Atavism, Atavism Network in Unity, we have a game engine that has all the core components of an MMO working out of the box. While switching did cause some setbacks, it was critical due to Big World no longer supporting indies and our players are unable to install the game when they upgraded their computers. So we are continuing to work on the alpha phase of development even now, 
using atavism in Unity. But development is slow because our hours are limited. We need churches, businesses, parents, grandparents, gamers of all ages to walk with us in this journey, support us financially, prayerfully, and vocally. Tell your friends about us. We don't want to be the best kept secret in the game industry. We encourage and support other Christian game developers to work on their games too. The world needs Christian games for all the reasons I've been talking about and more. The world needs meaningful games that impact people's lives for the better. The world needs games that when they play the game, it drives them to make positive choices in their real life outside the game as well. The world needs games that will teach them life skills, give them spiritual hope, and strengthen friendships rather than breaking them. Games impact culture. The games people play influence their mindset, their goals in life, the way they spend their free time, and even who they associate with on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether someone is working on a Christian Morpeg like we are, or a tabletop game or a console game, we want to see more positive, uplifting, and meaningful content in the game industry. While we are designing and have plans for multiple titles, we can't make all the games. God has called many other people to create games that impact the world for good, for his kingdom, and we encourage all those with this calling to connect to the Christian Game Developers Conference where they can meet other like-minded individuals. Together, we are stronger. We can pray for one another, encourage one another, help each other, and lift each other up. If you are listening to this talk and excited about what you're hearing, but don't feel like God has called you to make games for Jesus, but you still want to help make the world a better place through games, I encourage you to find a Christian game developer to support on a monthly basis. Just as churches send out missionaries with monthly contributions from the congregation, we need supporters to invest in this work we are doing for the kingdom as well. Traditional missionaries reach unreached people in distant places around the world, like jungles and deserts and nations that are hostile to preaching the gospel. Christian game developers have a mission to reach unreached people that traditional missionaries will rarely encounter. Gamers are not in the jungles of the Amazon or the deserts of Africa, although some are in communist and Muslim countries. They also are not at homeless shelters, drug rehab centers, prisons, or soup kitchens. Gamers, for the most part, are safe in their homes with snacks at their desk, a comfortable chair to sit in, and living respectable lives. They don't need help from the church or missions programs. Their needs are being met. They don't know that they need Jesus because the church hasn't offered them anything they don't already have. This is where Christian games can make an impact for eternity, is by introducing players to Jesus through meaningful gameplay, through learning life skills that improve their daily lives, through incorporating concepts of good and evil, along with information about life after death through gameplay. When you donate to the work of a Christian game development team, you can impact lives in your own community, as well as around the world, wherever the game is being played. Time is running short. We all see the signs happening in the news that we are in, that indicate we are in the last days. However, even if humanity has 10, 20, or 50 years left, not everyone does. People are getting killed in car accidents, shootings, poisonings, drownings, from illnesses, injuries, and all kinds of things every day. We are never promised another tomorrow. What we do today matters. Every person we meet is the life that we touch. Make your touch count. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? So how do we know that our games are a winning investment? How do we know that players will come when the game is done? Well, let's take a look at the numbers. Dollars and statistics are unbiased data that we can review to see what the realistic business potential really is. Video games are the world's fastest growing form of entertainment, 
and people are playing games more often than they go to the movies now. Here is some information about the game industry from the research group ESA, Entertainment Software Association. These numbers are from 2022, which is the most recent year which I have data for available. If there is more recent data, I did not have time to gather it for this event. The gamer population. There are 215.5 million active video game players across all ages in the United States. That's 66% of Americans playing video games. This is up from 155 million Americans playing video games in 2014. I don't have data for the number of video game players worldwide. 70% of men and boys in the United States play video games. 62% of women and girls in the United States play video games. The average gamer in the United States is 33 years old. 52% of gamers are male. 48% of gamers are female. So what about gamer spending? In 2021, Americans spent $60.4 billion, that's with a B, dollars on video games. This is up from $56.1 billion in 2020 and just $15.4 billion in 2014. 67% of players make in-game purchases at least a few times a year. $60.4 billion divided by 215.5 million players equals $280.28 per player spent on games in 2022. This is compared to $15.4 billion divided by 115 million players in 2014 for $133.91 spent per player on games in 2014. This is a more than 200% increase in the amount players are spending on games over an eight-year period. So how old are they? Games are just for kids, right? To some degree, but not entirely. Games do reach kids, but games also reach adults. 24% are under the age of 18. So about a quarter of the gamer population are minors. 36% are 18 to 34 years old. It's almost a th that's over a third. 25% are 35 to 54 years old. That's another quarter. And 14% are 55 years and older. 31% of players have children under 18 in their homes. So how much time do they spend playing games? 92% of players report spending as much or more time playing now than they did at the pandemic's peak. 61% plan to maintain their playing habits in the coming year. 19% plan to spend more time playing in the coming year. 53% of players play seven or more hours per week. How do games affect relationships? Well, according to ESA, 83% of players say games introduce people to new friendships and relationships. 46% have met a good friend, a spouse, or significant other through video games. 61% of players have met people through video games they otherwise would not have met. 61% of players say video games help them stay connected with friends or family. 72% see benefits of games for existing relationships. Most parents have household rules for video games. 92% require their children to obtain permission to make in-game purchases. 82% of parents require their children to secure permission before playing a new game. 79% of families have screen time rules for playing video games, such as the time of day or how long they can play, or both. 76% say their children must get parental permission to communicate with others online. 77% of parents play games with their children at least weekly. This is up from 55% in 2020. 
91% of parents agree that video games help develop problem-solving skills, and 80% agree that video games help de develop communication skills. So how big is the Morpeg market? 41% of games played are role-playing and narrative games. This is up from 20% of the best-selling computer games sold in 2014 being role-playing games. The 2021-2022 report combines PC and console game numbers in the same category. This likely changes the numbers significantly for top-ranking games, but I don't have the data for PC games listed separately. However, that number says that the number one PC console game in 2021 was Call of Duty, which is an FPS. In 2014, World of Warcraft, the world famous Morpeg, held position number five for their most recent expansion pack at the time, and number 18 for their new player starter pack for top computer games sold in the United States. This one game alone had over 6 million active players in 2014. I don't have current data for World of Warcraft today. These game facts came from ESA, the Entertainment Software Association, which you can find at theesa.com. So, what about Christianity? What is the role of Christianity in society is changing? According to an ABC News poll in July of 2015, 83% of Americans consider themselves to be Christians. According to a Pew Research report in 2022, the number of Americans who identify as Christian has dropped to 63%. While the number of Americans who say they have no re re religious affiliation has grown to 30%. They estimate that between the ages of 15 and 19, that 31% of Americans who are raised as Christian become religiously unaffiliated. This begs the question of what is being taught in high schools and colleges and what Christians are doing to address this problem. But that's another talk for another day. So. If 83% of the population was Christian in 2014 and 115 million Americans were playing games at that time, that means there were about 95,450,000 Christians playing games in 2014. Let's compare that to 63% of the American population being Christian in 22 and 215.5 million Americans playing games now. That means there are 135,765,000 Christians playing games today. This is a significant audience of players who would potentially be looking for edifying content in the games that they play. So even as a Christian population declines as young people are leaving the church, more of that population is known to be playing games than ever before. So we have a tremendous opportunity to impact culture for Christ through games, possibly even bringing some of those people back into the faith through exposure to positive experiences in Christian games. So what does that look like from our perspective as developers making a Christian Morpeg? 41% of those Christian players potentially interested in role-playing games would be 55.6 million Christian gamers. 55.6 million gamers multiplied by $280.28 equals 15,583,568,568,000 a year. Basically, over $15.5 billion a year being spent on Christians, by Christians, on video games. That's just from the 41% of Christian gamers who are interested in role-playing games. That doesn't count all the Christians who play every kind of game out there. That seems like a significant share of the market to me. So where are Christian games in all of this? Data on Christian games is harder to find. According to research done by the Christian Game Developers Conference in 2015, there were, at that time, a grand total of 197 overtly Christian games that we're currently aware of as of January 2016. Of those, 49 are card games or board games, not video games. 
If you subtract the non-video games, that gives a total of 148 Christian video games. Of those, 76 are what would be classified as retro or classic. They include titles like Axis Adventures, Bible Man, Dance Praise, and others. If you subtract the classic and retro games, that gives a final total of 72 contemporary Christian video games. Of those 72 Christian video games, 61 are released and 11, including Visions, are still in development. Two of those titles call themselves MMOs, but they are both designed specifically for small children. This leaves Visions as the only known Christian Morpeg for adults anywhere in the world. There is no fully developed AAA Christian Morpeg available at all right now. Visions is the only Christian game that strives to match the interest level and complexity of a Morpeg on the same scale or content level as EverQuest, World of Warcraft, Vanguard, Terra, or Tale in the Desert. There are some small-scale multiplayer Christian games, and there are some single-player Christian games. There are more than 400 Christian game developers who are working on making new and better games. Some are working on overtly Christian projects where others are working on secular game projects and trying to add a Christian influence. Some of these Christian game developers meet in the summer for the Christian Game Developers Conference, which has been convening since 2001. One of the goals of CGDC is to attempt to bring Christian game developers together to advance the Christian game industry. It's a small conference attended on average by 50 to 100 developers every year. I've been attending this conference almost every summer since 2006. I've learned a lot from my fellow game developers at these conferences. We have discussed everything from game engines, design process, musical scores, and programming languages to marketing and product branding, as well as spiritual impact and scripture content in games. We've shared meals together, prayed together, and even designed games and weekend challenges together. I've met some people there who have become very dear friends to me. They are passionate, dedicated people who love the Lord, and almost all of them are working on their projects with insufficient funds. If you've ever wondered why there aren't more Christian games, it isn't because there aren't any Christian developers working on projects. It's because there aren't enough churches or businesses or groups of individuals walking beside them with prayers and financial support to bring those projects to their maximum potential. It's the reason it has taken us 21 years of working with volunteers and we are still not completed to live launch yet. It's time we change that. Start today by joining us on this journey. Commit to pray for us daily. Become an active sponsor on the visionsgame.com website and contribute monthly to our development project. Or better yet, download the game and play with us. And yes, everyone who contributes financially to our project gains access to the Visions Alpha test clients. So you can log into the game. If you have a business, you may be able to write off the investment of an in-game monument as marketing expense, but please consult with your tax advisor about this. We are not tax specialists. Whether you walk with us through prayer or through finances, if you love what we are doing, please tell your friends about us. We want the whole world to know about Visions. Thanks for playing. See all the games we're making at tinyzoo.com. Thank you for listening to my speech. <laughs>